You're listening to the Odessa Christian Faith Center podcast, where we dig deeper into God's Word and how it will transform our lives. Now here's your host, Mark Blair. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Odessa Christian Faith Center podcast. I'm Mark Blair, your host, and today I'm sitting down with Kim Alvarado. How are you, Kim? I'm doing well. And Christy Lofton is here on a mic with us. How are you doing today, Christy? I am well. And we are in the third week of our marriage series. And Christy, what are we doing this week? So far in our marriage series, we've talked to Daryl Campbell Jr. and you last week about what it means to be a young man living as a Christian in the 21st century who is single. And in the first week, we talked about kingdom living and being single, being a single female. I shared my perspective on that along with what the Word says. And this week, today, I really wanted to zero in on another category of being single, and that is single parenting. So that's why we have Kimberly here. She's a member of our staff, and she is a single parent. And Kim, you've been on here with us before, and what did you talk about last time you were on the podcast with us? So the last time that I was on, um, we were going over Pastor on series, The Real You. Mm -hmm. And so we were just going over the impact that it had on my life and just how it helped me in that particular season of my life Mm -hmm. and why that series was one that stuck out to me and that just helped me a whole lot. Okay, that's cool. And I like that that's what you talked about last time because I feel like it really leads into what we're going to talk about today. Now, you are a single mother. Do you have a son or a daughter? I have a 10-year-old daughter. 10 years old. What's her name? Yes, her name's Caitlin. And so she's, what grade is she in? She's in the fifth. I always think that (laughs) she's younger than she is. No. That is Probably because we met her when she was younger. I wish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how about that? How does that make you feel that she's a fifth grader? Like, how did you um, feel this year knowing that she's going into her last year of elementary? Um, I'm not going to say it made me feel old, but it just made me feel like, you know, we've come a long way. And it's mm-hmm. it just kind of showed me, like, how far we've come. Yeah. So... How was it whenever she was first born? What was it like coming home from the hospital? Hmm, let's see. Because let's, let's take a little journey, I guess, between coming home from the hospital till now. Because do you feel like you are a more mature, fully formed person now than you were 10 years ago? Oh, definitely. So let's Actually, can we take it back even further to when you first found out you were pregnant? Because I would like to hear what your experience was like. Like, just give us some of your background and and tell us, like, what it was like when you first found out you were pregnant. And like Mark was saying, yeah, let's take a journey on from that moment. Because I've heard it said, actually, before that a mother becomes a parent the moment she finds out she's pregnant and a man becomes a parent the moment he holds the child. And so I, would, I do want to take it back to the point that you found out you were pregnant and kind of like what your mindset was, maybe what some of your fears or concerns might have been versus what you've learned and where you are now. Okay. Um, So basically, I was pregnant at 23. I mean, growing up, we grew up in church. I knew God. We had a relationship with him. But those teenage and 20 years, you know, I did go astray and found myself in a relationship that I knew wasn't what I wanted as far as in a marriage. But I did become pregnant at 23, and at that time, I mean, I knew that he wasn't who my husband was supposed to be, and so I decided, you know, I'm just going to have to just trust in God and just do this because at the end of the day, he didn't want what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So the moment that I became pregnant, I think that was when I realized, okay, this life that I'm living, it has to, it has to end. You know, I need to, like you said a while ago, yeah, the minute that you become pregnant, it, you know, reality hits you, and thank God that it all just, that's when it all ended. And so from that moment, I knew this was no longer, no longer about me. From that moment, you know, I knew, okay, I need to get back in church. Um, at that time. My mom and my grandma were attending OCFC, so they're actually the ones that invited me. And so ever since then, I was in church with them. 
and it's been that long. It's been it's been a while. It's been about twelve years, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't 12, know 13 that. Thirteen years, somewhere around there. Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you've been coming here that yes. long. Now, so whenever you first started coming here, I was like a totally probably. Not, I won't say totally, but I was a mostly self-absorbed teenager, so I wouldn't have Probably. been paying attention. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, I just didn't realize it had been that long that you'd been coming here. So yes. all through the pregnancy, you were here at OCFC. Yes. Um, I think I was probably about three months when I finally told my mom or told my parents. At that time, I was living on my own, and so I finally told them about three months. And um, they were they were happy about it, and thank God that, I've had, you know, my mom and my dad from the very beginning. That is good. So me knowing that I didn't want to, you know, make a future with my daughter's dad, they gladly took me back in. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically a process of me, just me and God just coming to this agreement of, I need you, you know, you are all that I have. And him just reassuring me that I'm going to do this with you. Mm -hmm. So just coming to that agreement and, of course, Letting go of all the selfishness of, you know, wanting to be out with your friends and knowing, okay, that's not good for me. So, but was it beyond that's not good for me to that's not good for us? Right. Like you and your baby. Right. So, yeah, just knowing, you know, I mean, knowing that my whole life was going to have to change and just knowing, okay, I'm going to have to make some better choices. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you... Because I think that's something that interests me from the first time that you brought her home until now. And the first day of school was like a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And so from the time that you brought her home until kind of like letting her go into her last year of elementary school, like what has been the shift? Like how did you feel whenever you brought her home for the first time? If you can Mm. reach back that far. Um just, I mean, of course, it's nothing that you can actually prepare for, Mm -hmm. you know, so... Did your mom um, kind of, like, help you, like, try to prepare, like, this is how it's going to be, and this is is what it's going to be like to not sleep for, like, four months um, and things like that? Yeah, they did, but still, it's a whole different thing whenever they're actually there, and she's crying in the middle of the night, and it's just you and her, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to get up, and you have to feed her, and like they say, there's really nothing that you can do to prepare, because... Every kid is unique, so you have some that may sleep through the night, and you have some that may wake up three or four times, Mm -hmm. so you really can't prepare for it, but yes, it was tough, and um, yeah, I mean, I do wish, I've always said it before, like, man, I wish I was the person I am now, Mm -hmm. you know, at that time, Um, just thinking, you know, how much better it would have been, Mm -hmm. but then I wouldn't have my story. I wouldn't have all that I do now, just all the times where I had to trust in God and I saw his faithfulness and I knew he was there with us. It's made you who you are today. Yes. Yeah, it's really helped shape you. So how was it navigating being a single parent, like growing up like Like, or raising her, and, like, it's really just you. Mm -hmm. Like, discipline, it's your decision. It's your sole decision. Like, you have your parents to bounce ideas off of. Right. But it's really just you, so you make that decision. And, you know, how is she going to eat, and what TV shows is she going to watch, and things like that. And when times got hard, or you're having a hard day, how did you lean on God in those times? Um, like, if you can give me, like, an actual example. Because I feel like people say, like, oh, I just really leaned on God. <laughs> it's like, what well, does that actually look like? like yeah, right? w- in the real world, what, does it, what do you do to lean on God? So in the times when you're tired and she's got a dirty diaper or she's... <laughs> She's she's she learned how to say no, yeah. and she's throwing no in your face like it's going out of style. How did how did you lean on God in those times, and how did you, uh, what did you do? Um, let's see. I guess in the very beginning, because I think for me that was probably the hardest was waking up in the middle of the night. I mean, I was coming from sleeping till noon if I wanted to, mm-hmm. to now you know. 
nine months later, it's like I can't do that anymore. So even though I thought in my mind I was ready for it, no, when it really happened, Mm -hmm. I had to deal with my own crankiness. And I have learned to not be selfish. You know, that's one thing that it has taught me is is that. So just in those moments of I was cranky in the middle of the night, just literally crying out to God and just pouring your heart out to him. And, you know, a lot of the times it was tears. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, I can't say it was I woke up in the middle of the night and I was reading my Bible. Yeah. (laughs) No, I was in tears, you know, just saying, hey, I need you. And so... Is, Is that how you said it? Just real, because, and I think that's awesome when people just pray really basic, honest prayers. Oh, yeah. Because I think when we get in these really tough situations, you think that you have to have like this, like iambic pentameter poem of a prayer <laughs> yeah. that you're just like, oh God, thou art so holy and awesome and good, and I pray that thou seest me. Nobody talks yeah. like that. No. And so, what did it? Is is that how you prayed? Just hey, this is hard. Help me. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Just you know, I need you. I can't do this. I think that's what he that's what he wants. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to know that you're tagging him in. Yeah. You're asking for his help. That's such a good way to say that. I've never heard tag anybody say it that yeah. way before. I think that's so awesome yeah. that you're tagging him in. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's really good that you're you're talking about that cuz that is one thing that I think a lot of people who haven't been in that situation will take for granted like you know, you, you make jokes about how you have to wake up in the middle of the night to change a diaper or feed the crying baby. And um, a lot of people don't think about how frustrating it can be, especially for a single parent when you're it and you're probably working a full time job and doing it by yourself. And and even if you're not yet, it's still, like you said, adjusting your lifestyle and um, I Especially in today's world when you see in headlines so often, unfortunately, where parents just lose it Mm -hmm. and you have like shaken baby syndrome or they don't even know what came over them. They get so frustrated that they just snap. And I think it's so good that you're sharing about how you felt like snapping, but instead you just took a moment to cry out to God and say, help me. I need you. I can't do this. And you're being vulnerable and humble and, and allowing God to come in and bring you that peace that passes all understanding. And I'm sure it probably didn't happen immediately. It right. maybe didn't manifest that night. It's probably not, did not make Caitlin stop crying immediately, but mm-hmm. he just instilled in you and brought into manifestation that patience and that wisdom on how to really keep your cool in moments when your flesh is just ready to give up or, or as the world says, to snap. Right. So crying out to God, how did that affect how you treated Caitlin in the middle of the night? I guess it would just kind of help me, you know, get back into reality of relying on him, knowing, okay, you said you're going to, you know, be with me through this and just, um, you know, it would kind of just bring it all back into perspective of I'm really not alone. So, yeah, I mean, it was all I knew to do. So with that, if you at this point in the conversation would give like some wisdom to single mothers, what would you say to them? Let's see. The best advice I can probably give is not to settle. You know, I get it. It's it's really easy to just find a, find a man who you think, okay, you know, he's okay. You know, he's good with kids. He's willing to support me. At the end of the day, is he willing to be in church with you? Is he willing to be taught of the Lord? Is he willing to do all those things that are actually going to add a benefit to you and to your children? So I would just say, you know, just trust in God and trust him to be your provider. And I see so many women just settling and you know, it's sad to see a month later they're alone, they're hurt, and so they have to kind of basically pick up the pieces again, Start you know, over. and then they, you know, you see it a couple months later, you know. I think he may be the one, you know, and it's like, it's it's just sad to me. Uh-huh. And so... It becomes kind of like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. They're uh-huh. just going in circles. Yeah. And the main thing that kept them going in circles is they were complaining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when you say that, it makes me think about, um, and we talked about this in the first episode of, of being single, is, you know, just complaining about where you are. Yeah. Like you're single, and instead of enjoying where you are right now and 
seeking God first, you start complaining about your circumstances and looking for somebody to fix those circumstances, looking for a person to fix those circumstances. And that's when people tend to settle for, I think he might be the one, instead of just really focusing on who God's called them to be and and waiting for the right timing. And then instead of I think, it's I know. Yes. Because you know the voice of God. And the voice and God's not going to lead you to somebody who's going to leave you broken in three months or mm-hmm. or what, however long it is. So I right. think that's valuable advice. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think it's important to know who you are in Christ, you know, and, and and to seek Him first and to follow His leading when it comes to that. Like, don't settle, like you said. Like, you made a very bold and brave decision for your lives. I don't know if anybody's ever said like if you've ever thought of it like that but it is a very bold decision especially 10 years ago because our society was so much different 10 years ago yeah yeah. where that mindset is concerned when did you really start to see like maturity in yourself because would you say that you were a mature person before you got pregnant um no (laughs) so (laughs) that's okay i mean i no i i don't (laughs) You know, I was, I mean, I was in my 20s. I was, you know, living it up. I was, I don't, you know. I'm not going to ask you to fill in the blank on any of that. Don't <laughs> I'm worry. sure we can all use our <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure everybody out there listening can relate, yes. you know, living it up. Living Just it take up. it as your own personal definition, whatever yes. that might be. But <laughs> when did you see, like, God really starting to... I guess, I, I mean, he, obviously he was working in you the whole time, but when did you start to see, like, the fruit of that, like, as a, as a woman and as a mother? Um, if you can, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, like, this is the exact starting right. point. Maybe just point to one example right. where you're like, wow, that was, I made a really good decision as a mother. I feel like we, we don't spend, we spend so much time tearing ourselves and each other down, and we're so good at pointing out all the bad things that we do, but what's something good that you did? Right. Let's talk about the good things that you did as a single mom, you know, how, like, What's what's one of the really good decisions that you've made with Caitlin? I guess I can say probably the best decision that I've made is just staying in church mm-hmm. and just having her in church and just helping her build that foundation of, you know, this is this is where we're going to be. This is our priority and this is, you know, this is what got me through. Mm-hmm. You know, had I not had OCFC, I have no idea where either one of us would be. So that's so important to me, so I think that's probably the best thing I could have ever done to her, you know? Anything material that I could have ever got her, you know, had I had you know, the finances to take her to Disney World, anything like that, like, I don't think any any one of those things would be better than what I'm doing, and that's having her here and having her build that foundation and Wow. You know, that's I think that, I think that's really good too because I think and that there's not anything wrong with that like experiences and going right. off and taking cool vacations but seeing the value of the house of God in your life and instilling that into your children right. too and I see that a lot with the youth is that they place value in so many other places that it's the most valuable thing is sports and the entire world will stop right and hell will freeze over before a football practice is missed mm-hmm. or before ba- or banned or any other extracurricular acti- activity like I'm there's not go to dance right to go to church are you kidding me? It's just so it's just so other mm-hmm. in their mind mm-hmm. that 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 they would do something like that. But what you just said, I think, is one of the most powerful revelations that um, a parent could catch. And because I can speak to that in my life too, like we weren't always consistent churchgoers. We haven't always lived here in Odessa. We lived in Austin, and whenever we lived in Austin, we didn't go to church a lot as much as we go. We went whenever we got here, but whenever we were here, we were always in church. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you that I have not made all the right decisions. I have not made the best decisions. But the one thing that I have done 
is has been to be faithful here in the house of God. And it's almost like I ended up in the right place on accident mm-hmm. <laughs> more than oh, yeah. more than on purpose. But, but it's because I was here. Right. And Mark, you came from a single parent household. Yeah, my mom. My mom's a single mom. She. Uh, my parents got divorced whenever I was three years old, and there's four of us. And so <laughs> she, she could probably like <laughs> rope cattle. She probably has that talent and doesn't even Your know that she amazing. that she has it. Um, but she did that. She and and it's still in all my siblings. The uh, there's a deep. Um, valuation of having a relationship with God. Right. And she placed that in us. And, you know, we got to have some cool experiences growing up, but this, she really did make it a priority. And mm-hmm. it ha- it's had a, it's obviously had a lasting effect. Right. So what else? And I remember, I'm going to kind of reference back to, I don't remember if we talked about it here or if, um, we've talked about it outside of the podcast, but you've mentioned to me before about how you and uh, Caitlin have kind of your own devotional time right. with one another. Right. How, how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, so the way we do it is just, you know, on our, our drive to school, mm-hmm. we have a devotional and she... What is it? What's the devotional? It's the Jesus Calling devotional. Is it the... The kids one, right? Um, yes. There's a lot of really good kids devotionals out there. If you're like old and you're just coming to Christ, don't <laughs> be too proud to buy a children's devotional. They're pretty powerful. <laughs> but yes. anyway, so you have the Jesus Calling thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she sits in the back seat and she reads the devotional for the day. And if she struggles with the word, we go over the word. We I tell her the meaning. And um, then we kind of talk about it a little bit later. Mm-hmm. And she gives me her input of what she learned from it. And then... We continue with our, you know, just a morning prayer and just on our way to school and just, just basically just getting her ready for the day. Yeah. They have, kids have their own battles that they face in school, peer pressure and all that. So as a parent, it is our responsibility to help them as they're learning their own authority, helping them see that they have it and they can do it, but basically just helping them get a start on on their name. Yeah. When a child is born, they naturally have this inclination to want to please their father. Right. And they, they have a longing for a relationship with father. And it's because we're built to long for a relationship with our heavenly father. So my question to you is, how do you, how do you fill that void with Caitlin? How do you um, explain to her, like, if you do see her longing for father, how do you explain that to her? How do you f- help her learn how to meet that need, if that makes sense? Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, I guess just making sure she's in church and just reassuring her, you know, who God is to us. So that's probably the the greatest thing. You know, I'm so grateful that I have my dad, you know, since day one, who has taken that, that position with her. And so basically, you know, she sees him as her dad. So I've been really blessed to have have him there to help out with that, you know, and along with other friends, their spouses, you know, their husbands who have, you know, helped out and done the whole, you know, sports stuff with her, playing with her and just the stuff that I don't necessarily know how to do. So as far as that goes, I don't I don't really see her You know, that she has any kind of lack at all, you know, Um, and I think it's all because of the foundation of where it began, you know, and just being here since the very beginning and, you know. This is kind of a probing, like, personal question, but do you (laughs) mind sharing, like, areas where you felt throughout over the last 10 years where you felt maybe, did you ever feel inadequate or, like, there's no way you could possibly do this. I mean, we talked a little bit about the waking up in the middle of the night, but in the bigger scheme of things, like in just being a parent and a single parent at that, were there ever any like big major things that, that like thoughts of inadequacy or thoughts of thoughts that would come against you that you were like, I just don't know how I'm going to overcome that. What were those thoughts and how did you overcome them? I think probably the biggest thought, um, It's just like in the area of finances, you know, am I going to be able to provide for this for her? You know, she's going to, she's going to want this. She wants to go on a vacation. Um, Just 
that's probably the biggest one. But, I mean, God has always provided. You know, she's never gone without anything. She's always been fed, always been clothed. And so, so yeah, that's probably the biggest one. What stopped you from settling? I guess, well, no, not I guess, but I know... Um, Okay, so like I said, growing up, my mom had us in church. My, my parents had been married for, man, going on 37 years, I believe. Wow. And although they were married up until like a year ago, my dad was the type of guy that would come to church, you know, Easter, Mother's Day, Christmas, he was there. Mm-hmm. But other than that, he wasn't there. So growing up, You know, my mom had us in church, but, you know, other men always thought she was a single mom. And so we grew up feeling like, you know, she's a single mom because we knew, okay, he needs to be here with us, and he's not. And so I can say that that has been the biggest thing. Um, I remember as a kid, you know, just saying, okay, my husband is going to be you know, he's going to be a godly man. He's going to be in church with me because, you know, I refuse to have this happen to me, you know. So for me, that has been what has kept me from settling, seeing that and seeing what my mom went through, even though she was married. I mean, of course, as the woman, you want your husband there with you. You know, he is the leader. You want him taking that position. So being single and not having found somebody who you feel is right and because you refuse to settle, does that make you feel like in your life overall it's holding you back or keeping you from accomplishing what God's called you to do? Um, no. If anything, I think it's given me the opportunity to, over the years, figure out who I really am. You know, and just figuring out his will for my own life. So, no, you know, I don't feel like I've missed out on anything because I'm not married yet. I think that will only make it any, you know, make it better. But as far as, like, losing anything because of it, no. If anything, it's it's the thing that has helped my relationship with God be where it is now. Have you experienced a lot of pressure from society or your family or friends on finding a dad for Caitlin or getting married? Have you felt pressure in, by, any, by anybody? Um, let's see. As far as my family, you know, they're, I really don't have a lot of pressure from them. You do have your occasional friends who are like, you know, hey, let's go on a double date or hey, what do you think about this? <laughs> the other day, Caitlin mentioned something about... Um, Christian Mingle, and I was like, oh, no, you stopped already. And she, like, hands you your phone back yeah. here. I made your profile already. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> basically. But everybody wants to, not everybody, but people want to try to set you up oh, or yeah. whatever, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, I'm sure they mean well, but does yeah. it put any kind of pressure on you? Like, I do need to hurry up and find somebody. Like, how do you respond to that? I usually just, like, laugh it off, you know. (laughs) I mean, I've been there, you know, I've done it so many times, and it's, yeah, not ended well, you know. Um, But you just learn from that, and you just... I think when it comes to settling for men or women, it's like Saul in 1 Samuel 15. And it's the chapter where the prophet Samuel tells him he's going to lose his kingdom Mm -hmm. and because God commands him to go completely destroy this enemy army, everybody, and he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Saul is waiting on Samuel and he's waiting and he waits one day and he waits two and he gets up to a week and on the seventh day... there's, the army is pressuring him. They're like, hey, dude, we got to do something. Right. You need to hurry up, and you need to make this happen. Mm-hmm. You've got to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And Saul knows what he's supposed to do. He knows he's supposed to wait on Samuel. He, know, he knows he's supposed to wait on the word of the Lord. But he gives in to the pressure of everybody around him, and he makes a sacrifice to the Lord. And then it's so funny because right after he does it, of course it wasn't funny to Saul, but it's funny to us because we can look at it in retrospect. And right after he makes the sacrifice, Samuel shows up and he's like, what did mm-hmm. you just do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why did you do that? You knew you weren't supposed to. You knew I was on my way. Right. 
but you gave in to everybody else around you. And I think that's something that everybody has to hold on to, oh, yeah. that if you're believing God to be married and if you're believing that God is going to send you somebody, you need to stop trying to make it happen oh, yeah. yourself so much. And going back to what you said earlier about crying out to God, praying really honest prayers. You're allowed to pray really honest prayers. God, I'm tired of waiting. Well, right. okay, sweetheart, but you know, you're fine. Yeah. Maybe you're not at the point where he's going to bring somebody around just yet. Mm -hmm. Not you, Kim, right, but right. the general you in right. the world. Right. But it says in Acts 2.21, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I think we need to stop treating that like a one-time experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That God will continually save you oh, yeah. from every situation that arises. Right. You just have to continue to call on him right. and not lose faith in the middle of it and not give in to the pressures of, of course, you know, you're not going to lose your kingdom or lose <laughs> everything in your life the way Saul did, but you could lose your opportunity, oh, yeah. you know, by giving into what everybody else thinks or what everybody else wants for you. Right. I have one more question for you. <laughs> we'll wrap this up. You said earlier that there were things that you wish that you knew then what you know now. There were, like, you wish that you were the person you are now back when you first got pregnant. So can you give me an example of of what that would look like? Like, what would you have done differently? And maybe use that example as a way to encourage people who may be where you were 10 years ago. What can they do differently? What kind of steps can they take to not have that, I wish I had known. Can you give us some knowledge? I guess the biggest thing would be just enjoying the process. Oh, um, it is a process. And just enjoying, you know, like they say, don't blink. Because, I mean, it does, 10 years, it doesn't feel like 10 years to me. And when I was saying about, you know, wishing I was the person I am now then, um, most of it is just where how I've seen God be faithful and not worrying and just trusting that he's going to, he's going to provide for everything. And I think that's probably the biggest one is just enjoying the day to day and just enjoying that time that you have with them. Instead of worrying about possibly what's coming next. Right. Or, or if you can provide. Or yeah, how to handle the next thing, but really right. enjoying the moment. Right. You know, because, I mean, most of the stuff that we worry about, kids could care less about it. All they want is you. And so just enjoying it and just not feeling like, okay, just because you have a kid, like, you can't have fun, you can't enjoy life. And just enjoying it with them, enjoying the process until the next season is up and you step into that next season just... With boldness and confidence. Yes. Well, today's episode is really focused on being single, being a single parent, but mostly we're talking about being single. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like, you're a single mom, and so you have your own set of... Um, obstacles in your mind or real obstacles to overcome when it comes to being a single parent. So can you tell me how you view being single since it's a little bit different than probably how I view being single? I guess just just the same way that marriage is a gift from God. Um, I see singleness as a gift also and just knowing that it is just you know for a season and like I said, just enjoying that moment and just seeing it as a gift. You know, there's certain things that I see as a gift now that I'm able to do with her because I am single. Um, you know, if we have sleepovers with our friends, you know, who, you know, we have a particular friend who's also a single mom, and sometimes we do sleepovers with the kids. When I'm married, my husband probably won't let me do sleepovers <laughs> anymore. So... <laughs> I see that as a gift, you know, being able to have those moments with our kids and showing them you actually do have a blessed life just because you don't, you only have one parent that doesn't make you any less than any other kid. So just seeing the gift and just seeing, 
you know, seeing it for what it is and not looking at it as I'm missing something. Because you're really not, because you're complete no. in Christ. Yes, ma'am. Well, Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was great. It was great. I loved uh, getting to ask some personal questions <laughs> and dive off a little deeper. But, to open up a little. But no, I really think that it's, it's going to be a blessing to uh, the single moms who listen to this podcast. And because, single dads. And single dads, absolutely. Because the, the lie of the enemy on this one is that you're alone. That, yep. you're, that you're doing this all alone. And you're living proof that, that they're not. Right. And so thank you so much for being with us today. Christy, thank you for being here too. Thank you. Definitely appreciated your perspective and the questions that you had to add. What we're going to do now is let you listen to a clip of a teaching from Pastor Don and Pastor Paulette from their series LUV. And the title of the teaching is, What is Your Standard? So we have two questions today that we're going to ask ourselves. In relationships, here's the first question. What sort of person Am I now, or do I want to become? You know, as Christians, we're always changing. That's what the Word of God does in our lives. And there's a discontent that's healthy inside of each and every one of us because we want to be more and more like Jesus. Amen. So it's not that, oh, I'm so horrible right now. No, but we are going to change. <laughs> if we purpose to, to become like him. So what kind, of, what kind of person am I now? And where am I going? Amen. What am I going to be like when I become more and more like him? And number two, what kind of impact will I have on my friends, my family, and the people that I come in contact with? Some strangers. What kind of impact am I going to have? You know, the Bible says that we should live life on purpose. When you read the book of Ephesians, you find that mentioned many times about living on purpose, not just living whatever happens, happens. And waking up every day in crisis management or waking up every day with whatever's going to happen today is going to happen today, and that's life. We're supposed to live it on purpose. Even when we meet strangers, how are we going to treat them? What are we going to say to them? Are we going to ignore them because... We don't know them. They don't know us. We'll probably never see them again. So it really doesn't matter how we treat them or what we say. And that's really not true. I truly believe in divine appointments. Amen. That God causes people to cross your path for reasons. The Amplified Bible says there's no such thing as coincidence. Only God's incidentus. So you always expect in your life that you're going to have these great, encounters that are, they may seem insignificant at the moment, but they will have great impact on your life later. You, when we, our testimony when we got married, uh, we were on a plane watching some woman take care of a girl that has cerebral palsy. And we watched her the whole time we sat on this plane. It was, we were fogged in and we just sat on the runway. And the next day we actually met her and that didn't seem real significant at the time. But she gave us scriptures after she left our presence. And as it turned out, on our honeymoon in Mexico, we used those scriptures to get healed and for Don to get born again. That was not a coincidence. It was a God's incidence, you know. The last two months, Pastor Don has uh, taught an awesome series on the real you. Amen. The real you. It, it was a great series. And you, if you didn't get it, if you missed part of it because you've been on vacation the month of June, go get it. It's powerful. It's meaty. It's very strong. It's, I warn you, it's for mature Christians Amen. and people who want to be mature Christians. You need to get it. It'll, it will change your thinking about who you really are. And he addressed a lot of the crucial and critical issues that we face in our lives as Christians, as people. So today, last month and the last two months have been the real you. We want to talk about the real us. Where are we in our relationships with other people? 
So many of us go into our friendships, that's one relationship. Our marriages, it's another relationship. Dating, that's a relationship. Parenting, those are relationships. Careers, they'll include business relationships. And we have all these hopes and dreams of what all these relationships are going to be like. We have, we're very idealistic about it. Uh, in our friendships, every person that we meet becomes our new BFF. <laughs> except that forever sometimes lasts about a week. They're not, you're not best friends forever. You know, I promise you, uh, uh, if you have any past 20 or 30 years, you're doing really good. You know, we're blessed. We've had some friends for over 35 years. I'd call those best friends forever. We're going to be in eternity with them. That's forever. But sometimes we do things that hinder that relationship from going past a week or a month or a year because we don't tend it. We don't guard it. We don't keep it. We don't nurture it. We don't protect it. Amen. We're careless about it. We just take it for granted. God doesn't want you to take people for granted or relationships for granted. When you're dating or in your marriage, you know, every woman is Cinderella. <laughs> every woman is Cinderella. I got to think about this one year. We were teaching on marriage, and I thought, why is it with women, with, everybody grows their hair long for their wedding, and then on the day of the wedding, they, all the women put their hair up. And that's Walt Disney's fault. Because Cinderella put her hair on top of her head all the time. And she put a little tiara there. And so everybody wants a tiara too, you know. Every woman is Cinderella. And we, and we make such a big thing about not the marriage Talk to us. But the marrying. Talk to us. Okay? The event. Amen. We sometimes put so much more into the event. I mean the color, the style, how many, what it takes, everything from the cake to the flowers to the 12 dresses to the whatever it may be. And we don't give much thought to the ever after. The ever after is more important than that day. Seriously. That day is the beginning of ever after. It, de it, it does, you know, I could go back now. I don't even remember what our cake looked like. I see pictures of those girls' dresses. God forgive us for putting them in them, you know. Um, I remember holding my dad up at the altar because he fell apart. Not because he was emotional, but he took a tranquilizer so he calmed down. <laughs> <laughs> My dad drank a lot, and he decided that day he wouldn't drink till after the wedding. And so instead, he took a tranquilizer. <laughs> So I've got my arm around him, holding him up in one of our pictures, and we just laugh about it. It was a crazy day, but it wasn't our marriage. Our marriage is today, 40, 42 years later. That's the marriage. Should you celebrate? You betcha. Should, should you make it a huge event? Of course you should. But the thoughts should be towards the future of what is forever after, okay? Because we get, we build that up, the, the castle, the carriage, you know, pretty, I mean, everything, they turn into mice real quick. Everything. That, that night is quick and over, and you, you go, you blink and go, I spent that kind of money on what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? It happens so fast, you know? But the rest of it is, is not that fast, I promise you. You know, when we think about what our families are going to be like, we picture, you know, what they're going to be like. And, and in the 1950s, there was a TV series called Leave it to Beaver. And the, we called the Beaver Cleaver family. That was their last name. I mean, who would name their child Beaver? You know, that's a terrible thing. But the the funny says part, who Beaver? <laughs> I like it. I think it's cute. No, you don't want a Beaver. But the mother was called. Her name was June, and. And I used to get the biggest kick out of it because we'd watch that show and then I'd look at our house and I'd look at my mother and I'd think, she's not June Cleaver. 
Because June wore this shirt waist dress to, with a tie belt and hose and heels, pearls every day, pearl earrings, perfect hair. She cleaned house, she cooked, and all these clothes, they sat down to a formal dinner every night, and everybody said yes, sir, and no, sir, and everybody was very quiet, never raised their voice, and it was just not real. That's not family. Family today is more like... Uh, Everybody loves Raymond or the modern family. It's, it's, not, it's not a leave it to beaver anymore. So that, that bubble can get burst pretty easily in relationships. So what do you do when you find that the quality of your friendships, your marriages, your family, maybe your business, acquaintances, they all don't measure up to what you think? They ought to be. So we have to ask ourselves two questions in regards to this. Number one, what are we basing our relationships on? What is the standard? In fact, that is the title of today's message. What is your standard? Everybody has standards in life, and that is the second question. What's the standard that we should live by? What are we basing our relationships on? And what's the standard that we should be living our lives on? Developing our relationships by. See, relationships today in our world, and this is a topsy-turvy world mm -hmm. we're living in. Paulette and I, and we're not the oldest people on the planet, but we've lived several years, several decades. And so we've seen a lot of changes just in the culture of America. Some good, obviously. Some of it is just tremendous. But there's a downward spiral that takes place where there is not God, His Word, His grace, His Spirit, because God lifts up. Amen. God encourages. The world pushes down. The world discourages. All you got to do, I, I pay attention. I, I pay attention in the world. The Bible tells me in Second Chronicles to pay attention, to understand the signs of the times, that we're supposed to understand the signs of the times. And I, I've noticed the world that one of the things they love to do, they like to take the, quote, rags to riches stories. And they love to elevate these rags to riches stories. But the first mistake that the person who has been elevated makes, man, they're all over him or her to bring them down. That's the difference between the culture and supposedly the way the church should be. The church understands when people come to us, they're rags. We're all rags. And then we get born again, and all of a sudden now, God starts elevating our lives. God starts building up our lives. And that's why we have the church. Because the church exists so that God can be magnified and that he can begin to share with us his love, his grace, his goodness, and that he does want to lift us up. So relationships, by and large, today tend to follow the norm of the behavior of the culture. But here's the deal. Today's culture, the norm of today's culture is based on one simple philosophy, dysfunction. Amen. I mean, that word has come into our lexicon probably over the last uh, 35 to 40 years. When I was a kid, I never heard the word dysfunction. That, that word was not thrown around like it is today. But we live in a dysfunctional culture today. Let me define for you the word dysfunction. It's the condition of having poor and unhealthy behavior and attitudes with people. I'm going to give it to you one more time. Dysfunction is defined as the condition of having poor and unhealthy behavior and attitudes with people. Now think about it. Every relationship that we have from our friends to our family, to our co-workers, to our interactions even with strangers, is affected by and large by dysfunctional behavior. Poor, unhealthy behavior and attitudes. And I believe that, among other things, God in his church wants to break 
this dysfunctional behavior that has been accelerating from generation to generation. Now, you understand in this church, we teach about generational curses. In the Old Testament, God made this statement several times that he would visit the sins of the fathers who did not obey him to the third and fourth generation. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, I don't have time to give you the scripture on it, but there is Old and New Testament scripture that supports the very fact that when Jesus hung on that cross, his very last act when he received the sour wine was to redeem us from generational curses. Okay? So, the moment you're born again, you and I are delivered from generational curses. Generational curses are still here in the world today. The sins of the fathers, all the way back to your great-great-grandfather, are handed down. These sins and these behavioral patterns are being handed down from one generation to the next. When you're born again, those curses are broken. But, everybody say but. But, but if you don't know they're broken... And if you attend churches or listen to preachers who tell you that you're not delivered from the generational curses, then you will buy into the fact that you're still under the guise of generational curses and you won't have any way out. We are delivered, but you have to know you are. And like anything else, you have to stand against the lies and the deceptions and the manipulations of the enemy who will try to convince us that you are just like your mother. No, we're not just like our mothers. Certainly there are traits that are handed down just by viewership. As children, we watch. And so we end up demonstrating what we see demonstrated in front of our own eyes. But anything that's negative that we have grown up with and become part of our personality can be changed. Yes. It all can be changed. And so we're going to have to realize that the way that we've been acting and communicating with each other in this dysfunctional way, family, does not work. You know, anytime you have a scripture and it's truth, which is the scripture is all truth, but when it's relevant for our lives and we apply it, it works because God means business based upon what he says. But when God takes a statement and he repeats the statement, it's very important mm -hmm. to take notice. And in Proverbs 14, 12, and Proverbs 16, 25, Solomon wrote the exact same verse. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And so we grow up with these thinking philosophies based upon everything that we have learned uh, in our environment, the sin nature we grew up with before we are born again, our parents, society, culture. And we have these norms that we think is normal, and all they do is bring schisms Amen. and heartache yes, sir. and dysfunction and divorce and pain, and hatred, and the list just goes on and on. So, our ways, if we are our stand, if you are your standard, you will not succeed in life if you are your standards. If your standard is the philosophy of secular education, and I am for education, but if you uh, allow it to permeate your thinking with the liberal professors in our universities that God is dead and on and on and on and on, if you allow that stuff to infiltrate your philosophy and your thinking, you're not going to succeed in life, okay? So man's ways, our ways do not work. But you know what? God's ways work, and they work 100% of the time. 
Again, that was a clip of Pastor Don and Paulette's teaching from their series, LUV, What is Your Standard? Thank you, everybody, for listening today. We really appreciate you listening in. We're going to have a brand new episode for you next week about David being a shepherd in his father's sheep fields and what it means to patiently wait and work in God's process. You've been listening to the OCFC Podcast. You can find more information about Odessa Christian Faith Center at ocfc.org. Be sure to find us on Facebook and Twitter. Email us your questions or thoughts about this podcast at ocfc at ocfc.org. Thank you for listening and be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your friends.